podcast Stephen Wunker talks about building the future of customer success by rethinking the relationship between cost and innovation so stay tuned So welcome everyone to Jobs of Future podcast. Today we have with us Stephen Wunker. He's a founder and managing director at New Markets Advisors, a Boston-based consulting focus on innovation and growth strategy. With long track record of creating successful venture, Stephen has consulted multinational firms and startups across six continents, developing dozens of new growth platforms for clients. Over the past decade, he also pioneered both uh, mobile commerce and mobile markets marketing, and he led the team that created one of the world's first smartphones. In addition to his entrepreneurial and corporate ventures, he has a long-term uh, colleague of uh, the leading innovation author- authority, Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, in establishing his um, consulting practice, InnoSight. His uh, previous experience includes years with uh, management consulting Bain & Company, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, um, and the Soros Foundation. Stephen uh, holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, a Master's in Public Administration from Columbia, and a BA uh, cum laude from Princeton University. Uh, He co-authored Costovation, an innovation that gives your customer exactly what they want and nothing more, uh, published by HarperCollins Leadership. Uh, back in August, and Stephen has contributed to Harvard Business Review, Forbes, a uh, range of journals, and has appeared on Bloomberg TV, BBC, and other broadcasts. He has lived uh, in the United States, United Kingdom, Netherlands, Japan, Ecuador, Zambia, and is now in, based in Boston. With that, Steve, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Glad to be here. That's a fascinating journey, by the way. So why don't you walk us through your journey so far? You know, I uh, I never thought I'd be a consultant. Uh, I have always loved starting things. Uh, I was a consultant for a few years at Bain & Company in Boston, London. And I went there really after my, my MBA to, to learn. I worked in the public sector before business school. And so I, I wanted to learn about business. It was a great place to do that. Uh, when they when they work you 100 hours a week, it's a, <laughs> you learn a lot very fast. Um, but then I, I followed a, a Bain person over... Uh, he was becoming this head of uh, Scion, which was the British company that invented the PDA back in the 80s. And he uh, had this super secret uh, project to create one of the first smartphones using Scion's PDA technology. So I came over to lead that, and I was hooked. This was exciting, sexy stuff. We did this um, as a partner for both Motorola and Ericsson in, in different ways. Uh, and, uh, I, look, I had no idea how big the smartphone would become at the time, but we knew it was big. Uh, and then uh, going on and, as he did in that period to start my own companies in mobile marketing and then I did a corporate venture in mobile commerce. Um, that was exciting. And as I was hooked on that, I sort of wondered, you know, so what do I do? Do I just keep starting companies and hopefully selling them or, or whatever with them? Uh, uh, we had sold one of the, the previous companies, the mobile commerce companies. I moved back to Boston. Um, we were in, in Africa at the time. And uh, I, by chance, linked up with Clayton Christensen, who was starting up consulting practices based on his writings about innovation. Uh, and I did initially to do a tech and telecom practice. Um, as it happened, we had a lot of demand in healthcare and financial services, consumer products. So I ended up leading those areas uh, at this firm in a site. What I discovered was this was sort of a, a startup in a way uh, because we were creating a company, but we were also having all this leverage and this diversity of experience. Uh, and so I got to have sort of the best of both worlds. And I could really think about the patterns of innovation and what had gone right and you know, also what had gone wrong in, in my pre- previous episodes as an entrepreneur and as an innovator more generally. Um, but then I could also build out a company. So we did that with, with Clay for close to six years and then have been doing that at New Markets Advisors since 2010. Interesting. And what what is New Markets Advisors and what what's, what's your current role nowadays? What do you do currently? Sure. So we are an innovation-focused boutique consulting firm, uh, about 13 people based in Boston, but with uh, presence in the UK and 
Puerto Rico for Latin America and a handful of other uh, locations too. Uh, we really focus on helping companies uh, become more innovative, which is both the what and the how of innovation. What is the opportunity? How can we take that through from a general concept to something that is in market, whether it's a market for consumers or potentially just a you know, implemented innovation internally? And then the how, how do we embed that capability in a company so that they can do that repeatedly? It's a virtue of being a boutique, I found, that you don't have to go and move in for the duration. You can just help companies do that, and then they refer you on. Uh, that's one reason why we write books. Uh, so that's what we do. We have a principal focus in healthcare, financial services, consumer products, but we work in education, technology, oil and gas. I mean, we, we work in a pretty broad range, uh, a range of other industries as well. Interesting. Um, thank you for walking us through that. So. What I'm excited about this uh, conversation is I think your book, Cost Ovation. I think I want to have spent some time on that book and understand. First, congratulations on the book. Very creative idea. And I think I definitely want to dig dig deeper and sort of talk about. First, very innovative name. Like I think, and, and I don't know if I want to see those two words together. And now we do. So it's, um, so why don't you walk us through what is Cost Ovation? Like what, what is the thought behind this book? Sure. So, look, this idea came from one of our clients. They were at a chemicals company, uh, head of R&D there, who said, look, I don't need innovation on the revenue side. I am basically selling commodity chemicals. Salt is salt is salt. Uh, what we need to think about is on the other side of the equation. How do we use your tools of innovation, and not to create some fancy new product, but to create a lower cost business and critically, one that customers will still love. So he said, I don't want Ryanair that charges people to use the bathroom and to have a glass of water. Uh, mm. We're looking for something that has a lot of allegiance, more like a, a Trader Joe's or a JetBlue, low cost, but a great customer experience. So what are the patterns there that we can discern? So that was back in, in 2012. And so it was a six year journey to uh, research those things over time, and we've developed some uh, some clear theses about what is and isn't core to that. But ultimately, cost evasion is about innovating on the cost side of the business. Hence the term. Interesting. Um, why is this thing important now? Like, why is cost evasion? Like, why this book is uh, is appropriate nowadays? Sure. Uh, look, there, there's a bunch of reasons. So, look, there's a lot of innovation for the top end of the market. Apple is creating the iPhone X and then the XS and who knows what else, right? And that's great for the 5 or 10% of the population that can afford that. But a lot of people, whether we're talking about end consumers or we're talking about a B2B context. So, what is innovation for the 90%? Uh, you know, a huge but often overlooked part of the population. That's one. Number two is that cost pressures are rising. Input mm -hmm. costs are rising. Uh, there are tariffs these days, at least. Uh, wages are going up a little bit. So, uh, how do you deal with that? How do you deal in, a, in an environment of, of rising costs? Third, um, we live in a pretty good economic time right now, mm -hmm. but it will not last. The surest prediction I can make today is that a recession will come at some point because it mm. always does. And we are in the longest expansion since the end of World War II. Uh, and when that recession comes, they usually don't pre-announce themselves. Uh, and then people are in this crazed fit to cut costs. Mm. And frankly, by then, it's a little late. You, yeah, you can hack away at stuff, but both the, the the, the fat as well as the, the bone. Mm. But to really reinvent your business, to really uh, get at those, those important levers of cost that have a very material impact on your cost position, it takes time. And this is actually the best time to lay those seeds. So in two years or three years or five years, whenever you really need that lower cost position, it's there. Interesting. Interesting. So if if we if we see nowadays we are seeing a lot of innovative business model out there 
there's a there's a lot of wave of freemium out there there's a lot of wave of open source and and when you're trying this uh, very innovative business strategies how would something like cost uh, cost uh, innovation like how do you think about that when you think about now people want more and probably at a cheaper price or whatever so how do you come to a resolve with that we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast so for product companies, there is almost always an innovation process they deploy. It may be very sophisticated, it may be very rudimentary, but there's always some sort of process. For services, it varies. Hmm. For business models, it is almost non-existent. Hmm. Uh, and we're not just talking about business model, we're also talking about the product, we're talking about the ecosystem, the customer experience. We're, we're looking very uh, holistically across the business. But this doesn't exist. So hiving this off just to product development is often not the right place, although you know, they, they can do things with it. This is really sort of the province of a general manager to say, you know, what is, what's going on here with, with my business? How can I think about it more creatively? What are very different approaches that we can use? Medtronic has done this. They have a center for business model innovation that reports in at a very high level, and they uh, experiment with totally different routes to market, like how do you sell pacemakers in India, for instance, where a lot of people don't even know they have a heart condition. So um, once you can do that, then you have a lot of degrees of freedom. Now, if you're not a general manager, there's still things that you can do internally. Uh, we work with a, with a big IT company that has prizes for innovation in facilities management or in uh, accounts receivable in corners of the company that are often really neglected for innovation, but you can have innovation, cost innovation in those parts of the company too. Interesting. So if um, I have just heard about this word, word called cost innovation, and then probably I have not yet purchased the book probably, how should I get started with that? Like bef uh, besides buying this book and reading through it, what are some, like, if, what are some of the tactical steps you could say, hey, like do these five things and you're on, on your journey to uh, a wonderful cost innovative mm -hmm. cost innovation? Sure, sure. Well, the, the last chapter of the book is a checklist for getting started. So it's very detailed. Um, but, you know, it begins in knowing, much like with any innovation, why mm. are you looking for cost innovation? Uh, what, what strategic objective is there? Is it because you're a higher cost than your competitors? Is it because you're trying to attack a lower end or more price conscious segment of the market? Uh, you're trying to grow your business. They just want to increase your margins. Uh, all of these may be valid objectives. It's hard for all of them to coexist at once. So establish that sort of strategic compass heading and then you can focus on the right kinds of cost innovation. Is it something that the consumer will reap the benefits of? Is it something completely invisible to them? Uh, is it something that will create a barrier for other companies? Um, and then we have a three-step process for how you actually go find these innovation opportunities. Um, you need to re-examine your assumptions. We have a lot of tools, techniques for how to do that in a very disciplined, granular sort of way. Um, but you know, rip it apart. This is how Lyft got founded. The owners had a, a ride sharing service. It was based on a sort of carpooling. Uh, it did okay, um, but they realized what had changed was that since they invented that service, the smartphone had become widely adopted. So how could they readapt things if they were gonna start out today? And then they had the idea for, for Lyft. Um, that's step one. Step two is to establish focus. Where are your real leverage points? Um, and maybe it's in your distribution systems or your sales model. What are those particular levers where you would like to reduce costs? And then step three is to think about that lever, but think about it in the context of the broader business. Really think expansively, which so many companies don't do, right? There's a, a head of sales and there's a head of distribution and logistics and supply chain 
Uh, and they may be all sitting on an executive committee together, but very rarely are they thinking about innovations across those functions that are sort of interdependent. But that's where, where the power is. If you can do it that, then it's uh, a much more uh, 360 degree innovation. It's something that's much harder to copy. And it's probably closer to what the customer actually demands because they don't care about how your internal organization chart looks. They care about delivering for their needs. And to do that, you often do have to cross functionally. Interesting. And I think one thing I was thinking about is, so when you talk about cost, right, you talk about a focus. Okay, I want, like, this is the product, this is the price, and this is a, how we're going with that. When you talk about innovation, you talk about loosey-goosey, okay, it's, I'm, I'm, it's evolving, it's, it's, it's adapting, it's, it's basically flexibility. So how much, like, how do you bring the resolve of, like, how much innovation is too much innovation when it comes to cost? Like, what are some of the, some of the um, boundaries or borderlines that you would say, hey, stop, like, don't just go overboard on innovation and you need a focus. And you rightly point out that focus is, is, is an important step there. What's your take on that? Sure. So I think it depends on what your industry is and what your company context is. If you're in an industry like software, you may, depending on the type of software, you may have many degrees of freedom to basically you know, create something, throw it out there, adapt it, see what works, adapt it again. This is what Amazon does. This is why this company has like 100 CEOs, um, because everybody can operate with a degree of autonomy. Microsoft is different, right? Everything has to be integrated together. That's the consumer expectation. Apple, the same thing. So uh, there, there's fewer degrees of freedom. Um, but then there are businesses on the total opposite side of the spectrum, uh, innovating in a hospital or in a mm -hmm. bank, for instance, where things by their very nature are very cross-functional. Everything has to be integrated together for quality, compliance, safety, you name it. Mm -hmm. um, and there your, your sandbox is different and just saying we're going to be agile in the insurance business. Well, you know, what, what does that mean? Mm. You may have these policies on your books for 10 years or 20 years. Uh, so what, what does it mean to be agile? You need to sort of figure that out and then figure out what innovation means for you. There's a, there's a related thing you need to do, which is to think about um, in terms of how innovation works in your company, what model is it? So we get companies coming to us saying, well, we want to be like uh, Google and Apple and Facebook. And these are three totally different companies. Mm. Uh, Google is very distributed innovation. It's very bottomed up. Apple is very centralized. It's very top down. Facebook arguably doesn't do a whole lot of innovation itself. It buys innovation elsewhere. It's very good at doing that and incorporating it in. And there, there are other models too. Samsung is very different. P&G is very different. So you need to figure out what works for your context. And then I think you can set the appropriate guard rule, guardrails and, and freedoms for an innovation effort. Interesting. And um, if someone is watching from um, uh, who is trying to innovate um, their cost structures and they're trying to bring innovation in that, and again, it's, I think this is one of the areas that not many businesses love to tingle too much around. Like they have, the entire business model has worked. They have worked through this model for quite some time. It works. It, it helps with their scaling. Everything is going great. And then you come up with an idea of, hey, let's innovate and let's see, let's tickle and see what's going on. How would, like, what would you suggest to that uh, innovator? Like, how should they approach uh, playing, playing down with something which is very, close to the heart of any any corporate existence like what what would you suggest sure so it's difficult to blow up a business model and build something else right that that mm. is a very risky thing it's not mm. what we are at mm. um but there are ways to experiment alongside of it um even in successful businesses you could say hey here's a real opportunity pharmaceuticals pretty mm. profitable industry mm. Well, 30% of pharmaceutical revenues go towards sales and marketing. Mm. It's usually more than R&D. That's not healthy. Mm. So, yes, we're not going to get rid of all our sales reps overnight. That would be a phenomenally dumb thing to do. But what else can we do to sell pharmaceuticals or medical devices or a range of other high-margin products in a leaner, more effective way, at least for a segment of the market. And that gets to the, the 
other part of this is you've got to figure out if you're going to be doing these experiments, who are they for? They're probably not for your biggest, most profitable customer. Um, they could be for segments of the market that you're not uh, reaching very effectively, for instance. Medtronic did this, as an example of the book, in their uh, medical devices, where they were selling uh, with very highly trained, highly compensated sales representatives, complex uh, pacemakers and other uh, cardiac devices. Mm. And they realized they were pricing themselves out of a big segment of the market. So for a distinct segment of the market where purchasing was not in the hands of people like surgeons, but rather in a purchasing department, they had a totally different proposition, selling good enough, perfectly adequate uh, machines, but uh, with basically no uh, personal sales support at all. Uh, the devices sold themselves based on the quality and the cost. If people wanted any support, they had to call up and they were charged on a per minute basis. So, uh, you know, totally different approach and not for their biggest, most profitable customers, but for a big swath of the market that they hardly take. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. Interesting. And um, from your vantage point, if, if, you, if you lay out um, someone who, is, who has no clue what like this, this idea on cost of vision to uh, a radically innovator doing fan, fabulous job, like, have you figured out some kind of a maturity model that businesses say, okay, uh, maybe I'm level one in, in, in this execution and, and then the, what's level five? Like, have you, have you thought through sort of uh, those area of how I can sort of relate my maturity when it comes to innovating uh, in, in cost? That's a great question. Uh, look, honestly, I think there are not many companies that are very mm. mature on managing their costs. Mm. Uh, some are. Apple, I think, you know, you could argue with their, their product mm. selection that's mm. gone too high end. But in terms of their supply chain management, well, mm. you know, the supply chain person became the CEO. Uh, they're pretty good at managing their, their supply chain. Nike, pretty good. But that is really the exception. Uh, and there are companies across a wide range of industries that can radically rethink things. Um, we had uh, somebody who read the book recently got in touch. Uh, they run a, a chain of restaurants, about 30 restaurants. And they say, look, we're, we're getting pressured on our rents. We're getting pressured on our labor costs. Um, you know, the customer is becoming more demanding. They want more diversity on the menu. Uh, and they're really rethinking things. So, yeah, you know, this is not just about the fancy industries. Now, with that being said, you do need to look at, just as the Lyft people did, what's changed to make So, for instance, if you have more data, you could use data in more uh, clever ways that lower your costs. Terrific. Medtronic did that with that pacemaker where they realized that uh, in these um, hospitals had a lot of inventory on the shelves of these very costly devices. Uh, and from the purchasing manager's perspective, they were being underserved. So while they hacked away at the, the cost elsewhere, they realized for this, they could actually really deliver and excel because they knew their customer was not the surgeon. It was the purchasing manager. So in this case, how could data about uh, availability of stock and lead times and potential demand uh, lead to optimized inventory management? That was a, a big deal for that stakeholder. Interesting. That's I think um, interesting. You you're bringing up the importance of data in that. So let's 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 talk a, a, a bit more about um, what does the role of data in in, in cost innovation play? Like how would I look at my data strategy when it comes to, okay, how it's helping me innovate my cost structures. Like what are, what's your thinking on that? Sure. So if you have it, uh, the data can be extraordinarily illuminative. Uh, not our, all customers are equal, right? In mm -hmm. terms of what they consume and the sophistication of how they consume uh, in terms of their buying behavior. A lot of companies don't know, right? But they're, they're not all equal. Not all customers are 
equally costly or uh, cheap to serve. Mm -hmm. uh, some customers are far more costly to serve than others. If you have data about that, terrific. Um, your supply chain integrating with the supply chains of your your customers, or look, your suppliers as well, right? And this can be totally invisible to your customers. Uh, Lee and Fung, a large trading house based in Hong Kong, uh, basically sources things like clothing from a huge network of factories across China. One of its big advantages is data. It can manage the flow of fabric to uh, to you know the, the 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 garment factories and from the garment factories to the warehouses and on through to their end customers uh, in a far more efficient way than this distributed network of people would do on their own without that broad data availability. So data can give you many many advantages in understanding where the costs are and what your levers are to significantly lower costs in ways that an end customer may be completely oblivious to. Interesting. And um, if I'm watching this podcast or, li or or listening to this, what would I, so what would you suggest to someone that, hey, if I, if like, when would someone should engage uh, with, with, with sort of this book or this concept? Like what is the litmus test where say, okay, oh my God, I should, I should get on, on the, this bandwagon quickly. Like what, what would you suggest as, hey, watch for these signs. And if you see these signs, maybe yes, uh, time to engage and try and time to see that maybe you something you're not doing right. Like, do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, I do. So, look, I think this is applicable for almost any company and in the in, in the industry. We've used it in in consulting to have a significantly lower cost structure for high end consulting than our rivals, and you know, it comes with trade offs. That this does not scale to be a 500 person firm, but we don't want that anyway. So that's, mm. that's fine. Um, so we have in, uh, in, in the book here, Costivation, we have uh, something here that uh, probably not visible on the screen, but seven signs that your industry is ripe for Costivation. Nice. Uh, and I think that would be a, a place to begin. Do you have expensive features or expensive customers or sales? Is your product super standardized in a way that mm. may not Fit all the use cases for your customers. Uh, is your sales super standardized in a way that uh, maybe you can significantly save out as Medtronic did for a segment of the marketplace? Is there uh, an imbalance in some areas of the business between the revenues produced uh, and the, the costs entailed in that? And finally, are, are you having contingency creep? Are you covering those corner cases that don't occur very often? Uh, but which drive a lot of complexity. Uh, I was talking actually this morning with a financial services company. Uh, I have a very uh, esoteric repayment plan that we have to have all these additional processes in place. Uh, and it drives a lot of complexity and cost in the business. So oftentimes, th there are a lot of different themes, right? But oftentimes that will indicate not just pockets of opportunity, but pockets of over complexity, which not only make your business higher cost, but probably restrain it from really accelerating on its competitive advantages where it does have a simple, powerful business model and which also consume a whole lot of management attention too. Interesting. And, and when you, um, in your research, so when you look at the company from the cost innovation point of view, what are something that almost like you see a lot of companies doing wrong or they don't get this? Um, like what are someone's in there say, okay, um, that's a, that's an opportunity for businesses. Right. So a um, few things. Um, the cost of Asian is often conflated with something like lean or six Sigma. This is totally different. And I'm not saying don't do lean or six Sigma. There, there's a lot of value in that, but that is optimizing what you have today by definition. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is about dealing with all the data that you have on what you have today and exhaustively using that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are ways that can factor into cost innovation, but we are talking about really trying to take a step change in cost, not just optimizing it, but taking mm -hmm. a step change. Uh, and that often requires looking beyond what you have today and what the customer really needs or how 
inspirations from other industries have dealt with a similar problem. How do you translate that over? We, we have over 100 examples in the book for exactly that reason, that people might be able to learn from tile industry or appliances uh, or razor blades or hotels uh, and translate that over to, to them. Um, so th that's a, a, a big issue, I find. The second issue is that people often treat innovation as a cost center. Mm. Uh, I'm investing today. Uh, and then I will drain the revenues tomorrow. And we are talking about something very different, right? That this is a profit center and this is a way to save costs. You should have a, a negative cost ultimately for, for this effort. Now, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of an outlay up front, uh, but really the ultimate metric might be some increased revenues too, right? You, you can have products that people love, even though they're simple to consume, with this Trader Joe's or you know any number of, of high or yeah, highly beloved brands that are not very expensive. Planet Fitness is another example we start the book with. Um, but you ultimately are creating not just that new growth business, but a totally different position in the business. So mm -hmm. that's why ultimately for a general manager, if it's a 13-person firm or if it's a 100,000-person firm, uh, that general manager can have that overall look at and uh and carve out space for these these types of initiatives we'll resume after a short break this part of the podcast is brought to you by first friday fair fastest ai powered way to find your next opportunity check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job let's get back to the podcast interesting and um other thing i was thinking about with with um so cost of vision was that it it closely work with the culture of the company, right? So that their cost strategies are very aligned with their bringing out their, 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 their core culture and <clears throat> their practices. And whenever you talk about um, cultural change or sort of getting innovation in culture, it's always, it always meet this, this sort of barrier of, Hey, no, we, it's, it's a change and it's a transformation in, 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 in its very slight uh, sort of, uh, Motif. So, what's your so? What is your point of view on that? That um, how could some like what are some of your hacks that you could suggest um, to the listeners or viewers that they could they could adopt to actually smoothen it up for for transformation? That's a good question. So we have a lot of writing on culture of innovation and creating innovation capabilities. It has not overlapped a lot with our writing on mm -hmm. cost of it. Yes, with some other topics, but not cost evasion. Uh, and, you know, I think the reason is that you don't necessarily need to have a tremendous agility in your organization in order to create cost evasions. You need an, an ability to experiment in, in some part of the company with some segment of customers. Uh, but you don't need everybody to be an innovator. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless that's part of the overall proposition, right? You're the, the Ritz Carlton where people are empowered to solve any problem and they do that because they have the right culture and training and everything else. Um, look, ultimately, culture lags. It doesn't. You can't mm -hmm. make a company more innovative just by starting. With it. It's important. But if it is done in isolation of initiatives that people can see in action, getting results, people getting promoted and recognized because they've been involved in these innovation efforts, whether it's on the revenue side or the cost side, then all the posters and ping pong tables in the world and bean bags, they're not going to get you the innovation that you're looking for. Uh, so you need to have that anchoring and stuff that actually happens on the ground. And, you know, the one of the virtues of cost evasions is that we're not talking about some massive moonshot effort here that's going to cost mm -hmm. you a tremendous amount of money. That would be, be highly ironic. Um, we are, are talking about things that people can get started often pretty quickly. Take a little bit of imagination, take a little bit of lateral thinking, but uh, ultimately the test is, are they getting some of the results that we expected or predicted? Uh, and if not, yes, you adjust it, but you don't have to have the whole company adjust. You can have a fairly small empowered team do it and get those great results interesting and and in in your in your research like do you know any companies who have shown um remarkable tenets of 
a cost on cost innovation uh, compliant company like do you have some cases that you could share to help us understand what would it take and and what would that looks like to sort of we can we can visualize better uh, look, I, I think it occurs across a really wide array of industries. Um, General Motors, you know, this company doesn't get enough credit, <laughs> but in, in China, they have been incredibly innovative about going after low-end segments of the market. Look at their their Wuling brand. They make these minivans, which are uh, you know probably smaller than the conference table that I'm speaking to you from. Uh, mm. They are, have a very tiny footprint but they're really made for the market. They're made for tiny crowded streets for cargo deliveries to very tiny micro stores. And that is sufficient for the market and it's low cost. Um, some of their you know, business models are low cost, even how they're pursuing uh, automated driving, self-driving vehicles. Uh, they're doing that in conjunction with Honda, a keen competitor, uh, but they realized for some of these really big initiatives, it only works at scale. Uh, and so they've been doing that in a fairly low cost manner. Um, you know, I think there are other companies that might be poster childs of this that you would never expect. Uh, Whirlpool can make some very high end appliances. Very few people know that those appliances, which are often very bulky, but not very heavy, are shipped together with kitchen tiles from a company called Dow Tile, which are uh, very heavy, but not very bulky. And so in a, in a truck, they sort of balance out. Uh, so that vigilance to those uh, innovative cost opportunities, that's a cultural element, uh, albeit that could also be more of a centralized element too, uh, that a lot of companies have been able to execute well behind the scenes. If you look at a company like JetBlue, right? JetBlue mm -hmm. gets rated time and again as the best domestic airline, and yet it has one of the lowest cost positions of any. It's because a lot of what they do is behind the scenes. Interesting, and um, that's that's just fascinating. And what are some of the some of the tenets of, of leadership, like what that you have seen uh, that you could share, or some of the qualities that um, if I am a listener and and and, and viewer of this, that mm -hmm. I should I should I should sort of nurture to say, okay, I can do that. That is a great question. That should have been a chapter in the book. Where, where were you when I needed to be the uh, uh, that's a great question, uh, but I, I, I have seen seen what it takes. So you need this this balance of things. You, you need to be able to have a vision and think laterally uh, and be very open to ideas, and yet you also need to be able to establish the clear focus areas and where you're willing to make the trade offs, because there often are trade-offs involved. You need to be able to set the guardrails and then let people get on with it. So th there's a yin and yang here of uh, you know balancing the, these different traits of vision with autonomy um, and you know aspiration with focus that uh, I think a, a successful cost innovation or and actually any innovation leader could really use. We'll make that a chapter in the next book. <laughs> Looking forward to that. And 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 from um from your vantage point, who is the ideal reader of this book? Like who who have you written this book for primarily? So um, I think anybody with a general management purview uh, has can make use of this. And that doesn't always mean that you have to have like be the country manager for Mexico or whatever, or the head of a business unit. Uh, we did some great work with the head of an accounts receivable unit, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, they had a, a re they were in the agricultural sector. They had a lot of problems with, the, uh, with um, accounts receivable, and they did some really old creative things. So there's opportunities in a lot of areas. Um, you can also be a head of operations uh, and you know, be solely focused on costs. Uh, with a good customer experience, and th there's often much, much opportunity there. The innovation people don't tend to go in, in, in those departments, um, but you know, any place is a place where you can innovate. You can certainly uh, innovate on half of your income statement, the cost side of things. Interesting. 
And and one thing that I was I was thinking about is um, the scalability of this 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 sort of um, concept. So if if we look at again, so cost has very sort of close bounds with culture, and then I, you, you're talking about some of the amazing transnational companies. They are they exist in multiple location, and I think one of the thing is that uh, each location has its own sort of local essence of like what sells, what's the price point, what's the market like, and all that. Can you scale, say, North American strategy to Asia? Like, when it comes to cost innovations, like, what's your thought on scalability of this concept, and like, how do you create those silos uh, to create center of excellence, like, global center of excellence on that? Sure, sure. So that that's the big company question, and you know, I should be clear, this is for small companies too, hmm. dry cleaners uh, and stuff like that. We've we've seen great success, um, but for big companies. Uh, Look, you're, you're right. Emerging markets are not developed markets. And uh, I've spent enough time living in emerging markets to know that people lose a tremendous amount of money uh, mm -hmm. because they don't realize the assumptions that they're making and they find out far too late. Uh, so if possible, uh, citing some of your, your, not just your research, but your operations in those markets and having the management of them be close to the ground um, is a way to take account of that reality. Uh, there are things that will surprise you. So mobile commerce, you mentioned I started one of the first mobile commerce businesses was in Africa. Uh, and initially the uh, directive from the head of this, this large telecom company was to create a consumer to consumer uh, or business to consumer marketplace. Um, but for a few reasons, we couldn't do that, principally uh, financial regulation. So I started just observing where is cash being used? And I would see that in the marketplaces, people would pay for a truckload of beer in cash. It's about $4,000 worth of beer. And moreover, the highest denomination bill in this country was, was worth $2. Mm -hmm. So I just imagine all the cash. And as I got closer to it, I realized that cash got counted seven times between the time it was paid and the time it was banked. It took two hours out of an eight hour delivery run, just managing the cash. There were tremendous opportunities. And the folks in the headquarters would have been totally ignorant of that had I not been out there and just observing and looking, and questioning, using some innovation behaviors. Um, so you gotta get out of the conference. Yeah, by all means, get creative in the conference room and uh, you know, we, we make pretty slides and we're, we're very proud of them. Um, but if that's all we're doing with the company, I'd be sort of disappointed. I would want them to get out and talk to real customers and other stakeholders um, and open their eyes, suspend their assumptions. Don't assume that they know what business they're in. We didn't realize we would be in the um, you know, back office cash management business for uh, distribution companies in Zambia. But we made very good money doing that because we're willing to just be surprised. Interesting. And I think um, um, another uh, thing I, I hear a lot about from the from the cost side of thing is that uh, this is a nightmare. Like, so you want to be in the market of want and not in the market of need, right? So what I'm saying is that people should want your product, not because they need, right? It, it's just because they want, they love you so much that they want that product, right? So when you when you when you think about that psyche. Um, how does cost innovation help in that? Like, what's your what's your take on how would it help sort of me figure out that hey, like, and, and in, in a way, I'm saying from the customer experience point of view, right? That you say that um, it gives customer what they want and nothing more. Like, mm. what's what's your take on that? Um, great question. So my last book was titled "Jobs to Be Done," and it derives mm. from a um, an aspect of Clay Christensen's writings and thinking about how customers are really just trying to get things done in their lives, not mm. necessarily buy your product, but rather accomplish something more fundamental. A lot of companies don't have that understanding. Mm. Uh, and because they don't have that understanding, they miss a few tricks on really what do people really demand and what don't they. Mm. We open cost evasion with uh, an example from Planet Fitness which is the number one gym chain in the United States for customer satisfaction. It just hit 10 million members. 
Mm. And yet it is priced at $10 a month, which is mm. like, or sometimes a 10th of competitors. So people love it, not just because it's cheap, although that sure is nice, mm. uh, but rather because they have a good understanding of their target customer who is the casual exerciser, or maybe the first time exerciser. Uh, they always market with Planet Fitness, the judgment-free zone. Mm -hmm. So you know, they are, are welcoming everybody into the Planet Fitness. Uh, and they know that these people don't need the extensive free weight section, or the complicated machines, or the personal trainers, or the pools. Basically, they want cardio machines. And they'll come in maybe a couple times a week and they'll get out after half an hour and that's it. So they are optimized around that customer. They give that customer a very good experience. Uh, and because it's a simple, focused business, model, albeit with a whole lot of customers they can target, they have 10 million members, uh, they've been able to create a better mousetrap than the rest of this vast, fragmented industry. Uh, they started that with customer understanding. Interesting, interesting, fascinating. So um, thank you for, for sharing your, your idea on the book. I think so now we're at the tail end of the conversation and I want to spend a few minutes on your journey, right? So um, in, 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 in your journey, if you say you have an incredible career, so if um, you want to attribute a success to some of the some qualities that has helped you stay what you are or, or, or stay stay, uh, where you are today, like what would you attribute those qualities to? Like what would you suggest are those qualities that has helped you? Uh, I try to be ruthlessly honest with myself and learn from my mistakes. I'm sure my wife would laugh at that statement, but uh, <laughs> at least in business, I try to learn from my mistakes. Um, and I've made some big ones. Um, I had some good successes too, right? But when you do innovation, you're, you're going to make mistakes. Hmm. Uh, and so thankfully, uh, I see more of them earlier in my career than later, although I still make them. Uh, and I really try to rigorously go over it very objectively and say, what, what did I get wrong? How did we miss that? Uh, and, you know, over time, you root out those causes of mistakes. You learn, you get better. Uh, you can't just become some expert and then coast. You always have to get better. And you know, hopefully, when you become an expert, you're, you know, you're asked to take on challenging problems. And so mm. they're hard, and you know, you, you continue to learn. You got to get good to to do it well. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. So one other thing we sh we ask our guests uh, to share about is uh, some of their favorite reads or some of the books that that they have read that they want to share. Like, do you have some books? that you would you would recommend to our, our listeners and viewers? Mm. Um, all right, so my favorite innovation book of all time is uh, plays The Innovator's Solution. Mm. Uh, the Innovator's Dilemma is what he's known for. It's mm. a fantastic book. The, mm. the solution is the sequel, mm. and it introduces concepts like jobs to be done. Um, I, I found it to be so amazingly thought-provoking. I, I read it just before uh, meeting, uh, to, you know, to take on part of the, the ex expansion of his firm. And I thought, oh, why didn't I read this years ago? <laughs> this would have helped me so much in so many things that I did. Uh, so I highly recommend that. Um, I, I, I think Chip Heath at Stanford is a terrific writer about a lot of things. His first book about made, it's called Made to Stick, uh, about the psychology about what makes Thing, people mm. remember things and mm. how do you stand out from a sea of messages and really get remembered uh, there was a lot in there that I try to use you know, at least on a weekly basis so I, I think Chip did some terrific writing uh, Vijay Govindarajan uh, who was kind enough to endorse Costivation and, and some other books of course uh, is a terrific writer and he has made some very complex thoughts very straightforward and simple uh, in his writings about particularly how do you execute on innovations, not just how do you come up with the idea, that's often the easy part, but how do you then take it through and execute it, especially when a business has to keep its lights on doing other stuff, how, how do you balance those mm. two apartments? Interesting, uh, thank you for sharing that. So um, 
as a last question and but not the least so if you want something um for our listeners and viewers to take away from this conversation something what would that be like what would be your uh, your parting remark to our listeners and viewers mm-hmm. innovation is not just for the people in the white lab coats mm-hmm. it's also not just for your premium most demanding customers it can be for everybody it takes some different approaches uh it takes a discipline bit of a mindset but there is huge applicability and huge potential in democratizing innovation bringing it to lots of corners of the company lots of corners of the marketplace uh, and really letting everybody benefit from the tools that have been so used so effectively here to for at least for the few interesting i think that's very well put and i i couldn't agree more and thank you again um steve for for spending a generous amount of time with us and and helping us understand cost and innovation and i would definitely recommend our our, our listeners and viewers to watch to read that book there, i think it, there's a there's a or audible version as well if they if they want to listen and i'll put the link um on the description of the page and and again steve uh thank you for uh for the book and for spending time with us and looking forward to seeing you back you're always welcome back on the podcast so hopefully in your next book um love to have you back and thank you so much great thank you i really enjoyed it beautiful yeah, yeah, I just, I just, uh. I thought I was sick of home but actually I was homesick never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick I'm so uncomfortable don't know anybody here just a couple dudes that I met once that's it and I go into the booth feeling nervous got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless is the mic gone I don't know how to work this inside I'm breaking down I hope I'm not up on a